grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Faith. You hear it spoken of quite often. Many churches in our town and elsewhere are faith this or faith this church. Faith expects good things from God and for God to keep His promises. Even in the midst of tragedy. Even in the midst of evil as well as injustice. And my hope today is your faith is made stronger by God's Word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Our Gospel lesson this morning is an exercise in believing. It is an exercise in faith. And it's important that we learn this lesson because all of the pieces of the armor, the armor of God that St. Paul described in our epistle lesson, he says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. Folks, I've had those fiery darts uh, fired in my direction, aimed in my direction. And my guess is you have to. And here the Lord is saying what? Take up this shield of faith. If faith is to serve as a shield, a protection against these fiery darts of the devil, who endlessly aims to attempt to create doubt and foster unbelief, and ultimately seeks to drag you into hell itself, then it had better be more than just this generic brand of believing in something. It's got to be specific. To just believe is like having a shield made out of paper mache. So let's see how Jesus forms faith. Let's see how he molds it. Let's see how he strengthens it. And let's see how, it gives it, how he gives it focus. The nobleman from Capernaum is seeking Jesus. As you know, his son is sick with a high fever caused by an illness that is about to kill him. And we can understand this father's desperation completely. I'm sure he tried everything. But this situation has caused him to look away from himself, to look away from his own works, even look away from his noble position, and to seek help from the existence of a healer, a helper. Jesus has already, as you know, changed water into wine, and the thought is this man heard about that. I'm sure everybody heard about that. I mean, who hadn't heard about it? This was headline news. If Jesus commanded water to become wine, surely he could command his dying son to be healed. And now Jesus is back in the same area. The man believed Jesus could do it. He believed that Jesus would do it. If only Jesus were close enough physically to where his son was, because clearly Jesus can't heal from a distance. Nobody can do that. That much faith this man had that Jesus could heal. So he asked Jesus to come back with him to his house. Now you would think Jesus' reaction would be, sure, of course, I'll come over and heal your son right at this moment. But that's not the response given. Why not? Keep this in mind, beloved. Jesus is building faith. A stronger faith is what this man needs, as does his entire family. They need this more than a divine healing. They need a faith that would last that would shield them from the enemies much deadlier than sickness. Speaking of enemies, St. Paul tells us, you do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, in an election year, that's probably something really good to kind of keep in mind. Do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but something far worse against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places? My goodness! We can't even see these enemies in this battle. 
And because of that, left to ourselves, there would be no hope. But the Lord came to bring hope and to give us a strong faith. So without answering the man, Jesus starts with a rebuke. Unless you people, the people around him, including the man himself, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Well, didn't the man believe already? Well, as I've said, to a degree he does. But he didn't believe Jesus could heal from afar, which means that he doesn't believe that Jesus is truly the Christ, the promised Messiah, God the Son sent by God the Father. And like so many others, Jesus was merely viewed as a special miracle man, not the Savior from sin, death, and the devil. To them, signs had to be seen because signs, they assume, strengthen faith. But that's not correct. Not at all. It's why the apostle writes, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith trusts the promises, and promises are words. Faith finds evidence in what it doesn't see. Faith knows that God works miracles, but faith does not rely on them, nor does faith seek a sign. Faith clings only and entirely to the Word of God. And here's the beautiful thing. Faith is satisfied with that. No matter what your eyes tell you, no matter what your reason tells you, faith is sustained by the Word of God, by the promises God gives. To think that seeing a miracle or receiving a sign creates or strengthens one faith, that's akin to someone trying to build your bicep muscles by drinking coffee. It's not going to work. For you'll eventually slide right back into fear, worry, doubt, anxiety, etc. None of which is from faith. And this is what makes us easy pickings for the devil's fiery darts. So Jesus addresses this directly. The people were not listening to what Jesus was saying or to what the Old Testament scriptures said about him either. They were holding back judgment about him, not believing him to be the Christ. Were they interested in seeing him perform another miracle? Absolutely. Somebody bring some more water out. Let's get this party started. Get something happening. But to trust him as God in the flesh, too much, too much. So in his moment of crisis, the nobleman wasn't really interested in anything other than Jesus healing his son. Lord, come down with me before my son dies. The man wants to see Jesus walk with him. The man wants to see Jesus step into his home. The man wants to see Jesus put out his hands on the dying boy. And the man wants to see this healing take place. Now look, if Jesus is truly sent from God, which he is, and if Jesus truly is the Savior that he claims to be, which he is that too, then why does Jesus have to go to the man's house? If God is able to speak a word and bring the entire universe into existence, is why that's our Old Testament lesson to show you that he can speak a word and it happens. It's called the performative word in that it performs exactly for that which it was sent. You and I don't have performative words. I can't even get my cat to come to me. That's a performative word when you say cat come here and cat shows up. God says let there be light and there is light. And so he is perfectly, from our Old Testament lesson, we learn very clearly that he is perfectly capable of healing an illness in the same way from afar. And so Jesus does what he always does, meaning he speaks and it happens. A doctor, even the best doctor, would have to be present with the boy. 
but not so with God. Jesus said to him, go your way, your son lives. Jesus heals the boy with a word from a distance. And he gives the man a promise, a promise of healing. There was nothing to experience. There was nothing to feel. There was nothing to see. Nothing at all. Seeing actually would come later. But faith had to do its work. The Holy Spirit's tool for creating faith and strengthening faith has always been and will always be the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of Christ. Before, all the man had was just this general confidence in Jesus as a good man who could do miraculous things. And that's a good start. But there's nothing specific to believe. His was a wordless faith. And a wordless faith won't help you very much when God in His wisdom allows sickness to remain or permits some tragedy or evil to occur. However, when God gives you a word, when God makes a promise, now faith has something to hold on to, something to actually cling to. And beloved, we have promises aplenty. So many promises that God has made. In Christ's death, there's the promise that sins of the world are forgiven. In His resurrection, there's the promise that you would believe in Him or that all who believe in Him shall rise again. At the font, the promise is that by washing, the Spirit of God comes to you personally and remains with you and in you for your healing and protection. In the absolution, the promise of the forgiveness of sins is made without hesitation. And at His table, the promise is not that Jesus make water into wine, but wine His blood and bread His body and Christ is your meal. And you taste and you see. Moreover, there's a promise that God will uphold His holy church, making it victorious even over the gates of hell itself. He promises grace and every blessing to His saints, strength to bear you up under the cross, providence for your body and your soul, fatherly guidance in your life and for your life, and as I mentioned earlier, even resurrection from God. Now, just those few promises that I've laid out before you, of which there are more, we resist the temptation to push them aside. This is why we listen carefully to the Word of God whenever it is preached, and we scour the Holy Scriptures ourselves, looking for those precious faith-building promises of God which establish the shield of faith that will never fail. The man believed the Word that Jesus spoke to him. He realizes he doesn't need Jesus to come to his house. Not at all. He's content to go his way, believing that his son was healed. Now, can you just imagine what that home, that walk home was like for this man? I believe the devil was shooting as many fiery darts at him as possible. Your son's not healed. He's dead. Jesus can't. Praise be to God, his faith deflects every one. He goes home expecting to see his son alive simply because Jesus said that he would be. As he arrives home, the man found out that his son had in fact gotten better at the very moment when Jesus said, your son lives. The text says he himself believed and his whole household. Including his son. They didn't merely believe that Jesus was a great miracle worker. They now believe in Jesus as the Savior sent from God who can heal from afar because He is God and because His Word is always and utterly reliable. Beloved, this is how faith is exercised in you. This is, how God, this is the way God works with all of us, building our faith. It's how He creates it. It's how he builds it. He is, as Hebrews says, the author and the finisher, the completer of our faith. God even stretches faith at times. 
sometimes so thin that faith you feel like it will break and shatter into a million pieces. But God knows what He's doing. Faith is His Spirit's creation. He knows what it can take and He knows what it can't. You've done this just like I've done it who knows how many times. You say to the Lord, the Lord is testing your faith and the Lord says, or, 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 or you say, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. I can't do it anymore. You can't stretch it any further. And what does the Lord say? He says, yeah, I can. It's kind of like uh, your rehab person. You know, you, you, get, you get your knee, you operate, get some new knees, and then you go to the rehab, and they, they, they start pushing on you and pushing on you. And you say, I can't go any further. And what do they say? Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Thank you. <laughs> That's what the Lord does with us. We say, Lord, I can't take it anymore. He says, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. My grace is sufficient. Yes, you can. He knows what it can take and what it can't. He knows what it needs to grow, and it grows by clinging to God's Word. You know, in a culture that's constantly changing and changing for the worse, where the people around you are floundering like drowning men at sea, searching for anything to hold on to, anything to believe, you have, you have been thrown a lifeline. The one certain thing that will hold you up for time and for eternity is the living and the enduring Word of God that strengthens your faith. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand for the offertory.